Hey guys, Julie here from the Carling Adrenal Center. I am here with Chloe today, who was a re recent Cushing's disease patient of Dr. Carling's, and he operated on her about six months ago. So she's going to tell us a little bit about her experience. So Chloe, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and if you could just tell us a little bit to start out about kind of your basic background um, and your school and all of that. Yeah, of course. Um, hi, I'm Chloe. As Julie said, I am a senior at UCLA. I grew up in like a small beach town in Southern California, which I feel very lucky with that. Um, and then started experiencing Cushing's disease symptoms around 15. I had a history as a competitive gymnast and was just extremely healthy. So it was very strange when my health started to take a turn. How did you learn that you had Cushing's disease and what symptoms were you experiencing prior to your diagnosis of that? Yeah. So my diagnostic journey was awful. Uh, it took about five years for me to get a diagnosis. And I think part of that was being a teenager and going through puberty or not going through puberty. Um, that just sort of complicated it. So as I said, at 15, I, I have a history as a gymnast and I started experiencing headaches and fatigue. So those were, those are my first symptoms. And the fatigue is definitely like a Cushing specific symptom. Uh, the headaches, doctors say typical endocrinologists say no, a lot of Cushing patients that I've talked to have headaches. So those were the, the two big ones. And then I started gaining weight intermittently, but with the gymnast background, so I stopped, I stopped training when the symptoms started. Mm -hmm. And when I was gaining weight, I just thought to myself, oh, it's because I'm not working out 20 to 30 hours a week. So that was very confusing for me. And then it was kind of just three, four years of chasing random symptoms, kind of nonspecific symptoms. And I, I look back and I'm frustrated that nobody tested for Cushing's at the same mm -hmm. time. I presented very strangely um so i think any like resentment towards doctors you know i was not te a textbook cushing this case by any means and it was we tested everything under the sun um autoimmune panels just everything and nothing was coming back and then the other component was that i had never had a period but again with the gymnast background that just was, oh, it's normal. Um, so by the time I got to 17, we were like, okay, this is strange. And that's around 17 is when my Cushing specific symptoms became more specific. Uh, I developed, so I started gaining weight. I became very aware of like my activity level, what I was eating. And I think I gained like six pounds in a month. and was just like, this is not normal something is wrong and then developed purple stretch marks on like my outer thighs kind of flank mm -hmm. and again just felt something was very very off um i was getting brain fog brain fog headaches fatigue insomnia wake in and still no period and at this time i had like three different endocrinologists and they all said you don't have cushings they didn't do testing but they said you don't have cushings and it took me another year uh, i was supposed to go to a four-year college right out of the gate i had a scholarship and got a the meningitis vaccine and became very very sick i actually got meningitis um it was a live virus and they did a spinal tap and when that happened i was like okay this is just not normal something is wrong and then was extremely sick for like six months kept gaining weight um, and at that point I found like a specialty specialist with Cushing's an endocrinologist and we did testing. Some of the initial testing came back kind of confusing. I took a break from it. Um, and I was cyclical and I had been feeling okay during that time. So I took a break from the testing, started retesting about six months later, and then every single test I did came back positive. And so that's kind of when we led into the treatment. Um, I was officially diagnosed like May of 2020. Okay. Okay. And so I know that you underwent multiple surgeries that didn't give you any resolution for the symptoms that you were experiencing. So can you tell us a little bit about sort of that um, 
process, what you went through with those procedures, and what ultimately led you to the bilateral adrenal adrenalectomy procedure. Definitely. Um, I started, so after the diagnosis in May, they, or he, put me on ketoconazole, which worked great for me. So that sort of confirmed the diagnosis. And then found a neurosurgeon in California at UCI who um, I spoke to, I think, the end of August, and he reviewed all of my testing and said, okay, yes, candidate for pituitary surgery. I had a four millimeter adenoma on the left side of my pituitary. And so we didn't have to do the inferior petrosal sinus sampling because there was something seen on imaging. Mm -hmm. I want to add to that. I had an MRI every year starting at 15 and there was always something that wasn't ordered correctly. And so it wasn't until I saw the endocrinologist diagnose me that I started getting like dynamic pituitary MRIs. And at, when I was 19, something started to show on the pituitary. And then by the time I was 20 and getting ready for surgery, they saw a four millimeter adenoma. So they saw the adenoma, we did the surgery and um, took it out. Mm -hmm. And then I, my, some, doctors, some neurosurgeons like let you crash in the hospital. Mine doesn't do that. So you put me on a bunch of steroids. Um, so we didn't know like my immediate post-op levels, mm -hmm. but I had symptom improvement for about a month. So I thought the surgery worked. I felt amazing. I uh, lost weight right away, was sleeping, just all of my symptoms resolved so quickly. And then almost exactly a month after the surgery, I started experiencing symptoms again. I just knew uh, the anxiety came back, insomnia, my face just swelled badly. Uh, mm -hmm. I was devastated. And at that point, usually the first surgery does not work. The second one probably won't work. And so I just, I remember the night that I knew it didn't work and I went to, oh, I'm going to have to get my adrenals removed. And that was very, very difficult. You know, um, I was 20 to consider removing organs but it was right away when I knew the first surgery didn't work. So that the seed was already planted. Mm -hmm. And then I saw my neurosurgeon. He said, we're going to try to go in again. I did the bilateral inferior petrosal sinus sampling. Mm -hmm. We did that on my 21st birthday. Mm -hmm. And that came back showing a problem with the right side of my pituitary, mm -hmm. which made me pretty unsettled because they had removed a tumor on the left. Mm -hmm. And so we did the second surgery of, in June of 2021, and they found abnormal tissue on both sides, removed it. I felt good for about a week, thought surgery maybe had worked. And mm -hmm. then a week after started started experiencing symptoms again, my ACTH and cortisol came back high. And I immediately called Dr. Carling's office. I think I did the, I think the day I found out it didn't work, I called. Um, and so spoke to him, had a consultation. He answered all of my questions. I felt at ease with it. There was one more medication that my endocrinologist, I actually had switched endocrinologists, but my current endocrinologist wanted me to try. Mm -hmm. And I was pretty ready to have my adrenal, adrenals removed at that point. I was done with it. Um, but it is, you know, risky to not live without adrenals. And I decided to try the medication really not for me. It was um, mainly for the people that love me, my mom. She was very nervous about me having bilateral adrenalectomy. I did the Isteresa, which was the medication the endocrinologist recommended, and had a lot of issues with it. Um, I have stomach issues, and it, it just gave me really bad gastritis, and I, I could not do it. So after about a month on that, I decided to do the bilateral adrenalectomy with Dr. Carling. Okay, okay. I'm so sorry that you went through all that. That sounds like a, a really disheartening process. Yeah, not a fun year. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it. And so when you kind of decided that that would be the right procedure to go with, did you consult with local surgeons in California for that procedure specifically, or it was just always Dr. Carling? It was always Dr. Carling. I knew, I, I'm a big researcher, like to the mm -hmm. point where I, too much, but um, I knew that surgery success depended on how many adrenal surgeries the surgeon performed per year. And I think most adrenal surgeons do like five to six a year. 
And so when I found Dr. Carling and kind of his bio and everything and saw that he does that many a week, I just, I was like, that's my guy. I'm, I'm determined to go to him. I didn't care that he was in Florida. Um, mm -hmm. My mom supported me. Everyone supported me. And there was my endocrinologist works with someone else um, in California. Mm -hmm. I don't, she performs as many a year, great surgeon, but not as many. And the volume, the amount of patients Dr. Carling sees each week and has so much experience with adrenal surgeries were very comforting to me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really didn't look anywhere else. I just knew I wanted Dr. Carling to do my surgery. Okay. And so how did you originally find out about the Carling Adrenal Center? Was it just through your own research or did you hear through, you know, your endocrinologist or how did that kind of come about? It was through my own research. I think that I searched something, you know, like um, adrenal surgeons or pop, not popular adrenal surgeons, but whoever does the most a year. And mm -hmm. I came across Dr. Carling's website, looked at his history with Yale, and I was just, I, I really liked it. It was really the volume of patients um, that put me at ease. And I also really liked the retroperitoneal approach. I think that's the back one. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was just it was just easy. Just went through the back fast um, and didn't have to like go through the front. I know someone else that whose like liver had to be moved and that just sounded barbaric and awful to me. Um, I also like that the scars are in my back and not in my stomach, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so consulting with him, I guess, virtually must have been, you know, a little bit stressful as well. So what, what was that process like? And did you feel comfortable right from the beginning, even though uh, you couldn't meet him in person until the surgery? Yeah, we had a phone call. And I think it was, I think it was like the day after I contacted um, and right after I found out my pituitary, second pituitary surgery had failed. And we spoke over the phone. He spoke with my mom. He was just very warm, um, reassuring, answered all of my questions, and mm -hmm. I felt very confident going with him. I know, like, not seeing a physician in person can be strange. I think everyone's gotten used to Zoom, though, with COVID. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he did a great job of just kind of answering all my questions, making me feel at ease, um, was confident that I'd be able to live a normal life after the bilateral adrenalectomy, which at the time I wasn't so sure, but uh, he's right. <laughs> and yeah, he just, I felt very confident speaking over the phone with him. And so what was your experience like, uh, your surgery experience with Dr. Carling and his team? Kind of walk me through that from, you know, beginning to end as you remember it. Yeah, um, I just, we got to the hospital early and I think Dr. Carling came in pretty quickly, maybe an hour or so after I got there. Mm -hmm. um, he is, he's, if anyone's considering Dr. Carling, best bedside manner ever. Um, he was just so sweet, so comforting, treated me like a person, not just, you know, like his surgical patient. But Dr. Carling came in and he was, he was great. So sweet, so comforting. Um, yeah, it was great. Physiologist, mm -hmm. as well. Um, but everyone was great, super friendly. I was very, very calm, oddly enough, the morning of my surgery, but I was so confident in my decision and mm -hmm. it took taken time to think about it, you know, research extensively and I felt like I was in very good hands. Great. And so you're now about six months after your surgery. So how have you been feeling in these months following surgery and uh, what has your recovery been like? So I felt fantastic after the bilateral genelectomy like right away. So I had my surgery date was September 21st. October was great. I was jogging two weeks after surgery. As far as like the incisions went and like the surgical area itself, no issues, still zero issues. My incisions have healed really well. I don't have any pain. Like I, you would never know I had surgery there. I would, I, if they did it and I didn't know about it, I, I would not know about it. Um, as far as symptom resolvement goes, I have a normal sleep schedule with Cushing's. I could not sleep. It was, I couldn't fall asleep until four, five, six, seven a.m. in the morning, and I was just kind of a crazy person. And um, I go to bed now like at ten o'clock, eleven o'clock, and you know wake up at seven or eight, like very, very normal. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm part of the rest of the world. Not being able to sleep just does something to you, and. Uh, I'm a lot more calm. 
brain fog is better. Just I'm just much more myself, and mm-hmm. I feel like pushing sort of hijacked my brain a bit, and you know, personality in some ways. So even though the the steroid replacement can be difficult and learning, um, I do not regret the bilateral genelectomy for a second. I'm very grateful I did it. Uh, just the fact that I can even sleep is amazing. So every night I get tired, I'm so happy. Um, and then there's a, there's a quote in one of the support groups I'm on. They say like, my worst day with adrenal insufficiency is better than my best day with Cushing's. And I totally agree with that. I'm not sure what it is about Cushing's that's so awful. It's just, it's really horrible. Mm-hmm. And I think it's crazy that removing organs and a bad day with not having organs is better than a day with having Cushing's disease. Mm-hmm. So last question here is uh, April 8th is Cushing's Disease Awareness Day. So I wanted to kind of hear from you if you had any advice to people facing a similar diagnosis. Yeah. So um, I mentioned my diagnostic journey and how long it was and how horrible it was. Um, I think my biggest piece of advice would be, you know, your body better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And I was told over and over again, you know, I got called not crazy, but you need to see a therapist. Your symptoms are psychosomatic. And that crushed me, you know, hearing that as an 18 year old from a different physicians, experienced physicians was disheartening and very hard to hear. And, but there was always this fight in me that I I wrote down and have like journals and stuff. You're not going to win like the disease I get to win. And Mm -hmm. Over and over, I would just write that down, and I, I, I did listen. Like I did listen to the doctors, um, and I, tr- I tried to think, okay, what else could do this? Do I need to, you know, eat better, sleep more, like all of the things? And I just had no reason to want to be sick. I was, you know, good at school. I was a competitive gymnast, and my life just changed really fast. And I, I had friends. I'm, I'm not prone to depression, so I think knowing your body and believing in yourself, I guess, even when doctors don't is very, very important. Um, you know, consider other, other possible, like just consider, like listen to what they say. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, your body better than anybody else. If it experiences, um, related to Cushing's, but not where, you know, I've told a doctor, this is going to happen. And they said, no, it's not. And then the next day they look at my labs and they're like, okay, this is happening. Yeah, I, I know. Um, and then the other thing I think too is this is hard with Cushing's when you have a disease that feels like it hijacks your brain, but taking care of your mental health during it and just kind of your emotional state is really important. I think there's a little bit of a polarity in medicine between mental health and physical health and it shouldn't be like that. They really are intertwined. I feel like I neglect. I'm a little bit all or nothing personality and I think I neglected that a little bit. I was so just set on fixing the physical side of things, but I think that maybe addressing some of the mental and emotional aspects that, you know, weren't the cause of my symptoms but were going alongside of the symptoms would have been helpful during mm-hmm. that time. Um, those would be my biggest, biggest two pieces of advice is just, I, I really think that at the end of the day, you know your body better than anybody else. Cyclical Cushing's is very difficult to diagnose. Find a good specialist and just, yeah, just, I mean, be aware. But I think that as yeah. patients, as rare disease patients, we know our bodies better. Yeah. Yeah. And we hear that. We hear that so often with, you know, endocrine diseases of all types is be your own best advocate. Mm-hmm. And you kind of know what's going on. And, and sometimes it's up to you to look into it, unfortunately. So totally. And it's still, I mean, it's the same way with adrenal insufficiency, unfortunately, just going to the ER, they don't really know what to do. Um, and I've had, I've had okay experiences. They, they, I tend to get listened to now, which I don't think I'm that aggressive, but, um, which is nice, but it's the same thing. I just think that rare diseases aren't super addressed in med school. They don't see them that much in residency. And so there you always just really have to be your own advocate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. You, uh, you're very inspiring, and it was it was great to talk to you and kind of hear 
your journey. And I think it's going to be really helpful for, you know, other people who might be struggling with this and, and especially helpful in help, helping us to promote to this day. So I think, um, yeah, I'm really, really thankful. Thank you so much for having me.